company. It's, a, it's more about the company than it is about the software. So we want the company name MathWorks to... Everybody knows about MATLAB, but people don't know about MathWorks, the company. So us supporting public radio is one of our uh, major, uh, uh, both philanthropic and marketing endeavors. Welcome, everybody. Um, welcome to uh, the first of the 2017-2018 Distinguished Lecture Series here at the Scientific Computing and Imaging Institute. I'm Chris Johnson. I uh, direct the, uh, the Institute, and today we're very happy to have Cleve Moeller be our, our uh, first speaker of this year's lecture series. Um, so I think most, I think it's maybe obvious that people know who he is because we have so many people here. I'm sorry that we didn't get a larger venue, um, a little more popular than I thought. And, <laughs> and uh, so uh, because you all know that uh, Cleve is the inventor of math, uh, MATLAB and the co-founder of, of MathWorks, uh, maybe a few, a few things that you might not know at least some of you, is that uh, Cleve was born at LDS Hospital in the Avenues um, and uh, grew up here in Salt Lake City. He graduated from East High School just a few blocks away from the University of Utah. And uh, he was one of the first employees of the university's I'll computer center. I'll tell, I'm going to talk about that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, uh, after he, he uh, left Salt Lake City, headed to Caltech um, for an undergraduate, and then at Stanford. You're giving for his, my talk here. No, I'm giving your talk. <laughs> all right. Okay. I will, uh, can, I, can I say who your office mate was at, at Michigan? Yes, or? yes. All right. So his first faculty position was at the University of uh, Michigan, and his uh, office mate there was Professor Frank Stinger, who is sitting right back there. And uh, so it's a small, small world. And uh, Cleve will tell you a little bit more about it. So please join me in welcoming Cleve Moller. Thank you. The part about Frank Stinger wasn't in my talk. So that's, uh, thank you for that little tidbit. It's a, it's a pleasure to be back here. As, as uh, Chris said, I'm from Salt Lake. I, I left here 60 years ago, exactly, uh, right after, if, after a summer job, uh, and then went off to Caltech in the fall of 1957. Uh, and I, my, my, my father was eventually editor of the paper in Ogden, so I came back to the, back to the area here a few times. But uh, I don't have any, uh, the only family I le have left here is you guys. Uh, then the new, the new people I met here, Frank and Nelson Beebe. Um, let me tell you about the evolution of MATLAB. Uh, I want to go back, uh, uh, back, clear back to this period I'm talking about even before, uh, and um, talk about how I got involved in this business. I want to talk about three men who were very important in my life. John Todd, George Forsyth, and J.H. Wilkinson. But the story begins with Alan Turing, at the um, famous for breaking the German codes in the Second World War. After that, he went to the National Physical Laboratory, where they, he proposed building a computer called the ACE, the Automatic Computing Engine. It was too complicated. It was based on work he'd done in secret during the war, but he couldn't tell his management about it. So they decided not to build it. It fell to an assistant of his named Jim Wilkinson uh, and uh, to lead a group that pr produced a simplified version of the machine called the Pilot Ace. Wilkinson d built the arithmetic unit. Here he is at the console of the Pilot Ace. He went on to become the world's leading authority on matrix computation. <coughs> Excuse me and was a friend and, and mentor of mine. Um, at the meantime, same time in Southern California, the National Bureau of Standards was sponsoring the development of computer, American computer uh, called the Standards Western Automatic Computer, SWAC. 
they gathered a group of mathematicians here at something called the Institute for Numerical Analysis. Um, that's George Forsyth, and the tallest guy in the center. Olga Towski Todd was the only woman in the group, and her husband, John Todd, is looking over her shoulder. This institute was dissolved in 1955 in a big political controversy involving McCarthyism and battery additives that I'll tell you about uh, sometime. And these, <laughs> these people uh, dispersed to universities around the world. Forsyth went north to Stanford, and the, the um, Todds went across town to Pasadena and Caltech. Here's a picture of the fac math faculty at Caltech in the late 50s. Olga Towski was the first uh, female full professor at Caltech. And again, John Todd is in the back row looking over his soldier, oh, shoulder. So Orly sent this around. How many people saw this in their email? Oh, good. So Orly sent this around to a few people. Here's a clipping out of the Deseret News um, in uh, the spring of 1957. Is the Deseret News still exist? <coughs> um, it's... it's um, well, you're not, not sure about newspapers. So they wrote articles about precocious high school students. And this says, I'm going away to Caltech. And there's uh, electrons whirling about my head. Um, I think I got admitted to Caltech because I was from Utah. And that was their idea of diversity back then. <laughs> Uh, at Caltech, I took numerical analysis from John Todd, and we used this computer, the Burroughs 205 uh, Datatron. Uh, it was only one of only a handful of computers in Southern California at the time. Uh, but I, I want to diverge from my usual talk and tell you and show you this is I'm about, I write a blog called Cleves Corner, and this is, where is it? Um, this is a blog that I'm, oh, come on. Why doesn't that open up? I shouldn't, I shouldn't diverge from the <laughs> regular talk. Ah. I have a I have a tremor. I'm talking to Chris uh, at tomorrow about it tomorrow. Um, but um, here's uh, I I have trouble clicking on these things. Okay, so this is a draft of the blog that's coming up about this computer. Now I want to tell you about it because. I used it at Caltech, and I also used it here. I was the, uh, this is University of Utah's first computer, and I worked here as a summer job in 1960. There was a woman who managed this, there were three people in the center, a woman who managed it, me, and uh, a, ga a gal who ran the key, Ford, a gal who ran the key punch, did key punching, and a guy named Joe, who was a graduate student who maintained the computer. Anybody have any idea who that was? I'd like to find him again. Anyway, um, he, um, so the woman quit her job, quit, and for the summer of 1960, I was the acting director of the University of Utah Computer Center. And we ran this computer. Um, it's, we have flashing lights here. It was in lots of movies. Um, the... Um, It's a room full of computer. Um, those are um, those uh, cabinets in the background contained vacuum tubes. How many people know what a vacuum tube is? How many people have ever held one? Okay, so here they are. Here's vacuum tubes. And this is one digit in the register of that machine. <laughs> it's a decimal machine. But there are four tubes there, and they used just the zero through nine 
out of the out of the sixteen states. If you ever saw uh, any digit high, any binary combination higher than that, it was an error. So um, here's a here's a poorly made here's an old machine that somehow been in an old warehouse. You see the racks of tubes there. There were about three thousand of these tubes. Machine cost five million dollars in in back then. And then down here in the right, there's a drum. The big deal about computing back then was what are you going to use for memory? It was before transistors, before core, and this memory was a drum. The drum had 4,000, it had, um, could hold 4,000 words, 4,000 10 digit words. And they were arranged in 20 bands of 200 each around the drum. And then there was a special band that took 20 words and repeated it 10 times around the drum. So the access time on that was 10 times faster than the regular memory. You could think of that as a cache. Anyway, there's the drum down in the corner. We uh, punched our programs in absolute numeric. We wrote our programs in numeric machine language and punched them on paper tape. Here's a program for that machine out of the manual at the time, and you can see individual machine instructions there written down. But we didn't have an assembler. We couldn't punch them in like that. We had to convert those to numbers and actually just put, put, on, put, put them on the numbers. There's 20 words. There's 20 instructions there, and this would fit in the fast loop. So you could run this thing fast. I wrote a program while I was here that fit exactly in 20 words, but it didn't have a way to escape. And I couldn't get out of the infinite loop. I needed a skip on minus instruction. And I asked Joe, and Joe disappeared behind, the behind those cabinets with a soldering iron and blueprints and, <laughs> and put in a skip on minus instruction. He says, the op code will be 51. So I put that on my tape, on my tape. We had the only, University of Utah had the only Burroughs 205 in the world that had a skip on minus instruction. <laughs> anyway, I, so that's a diversion there. I don't really tell, talk that much about the, about the uh, Burroughs, about that, that machine. Um, oh, darn it. The, when, I, when I get excited, the, the, tremor, the tremor gets worse. Came time to go to graduate school. I went north to Stanford. Uh, George Forsyth was, had been a, was a math professor, but he was in the process of starting the computer science department at Stanford, now world famous, of course. Uh, so I went there as a math student. But I my, ended up there four years later as a, a temporary instructor in the new computer science department. We were, used this machine, a DEC, PDP-1, DEC's first machine. There's a display on that machine, and a guy named Slug Russell from the MIT programmed the world's first video game um, that, that we played on that machine. Uh, it came time, an uh, important event in my life was to the house, was, the, was then called the Gatlinburg meeting um, in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, organized by these six guys. Uh, that's been a continuing and important event in my life. And the, the last one, was, the most recent one was just a few months ago down at Virginia Tech. So here's all six of these guys contributed to MATLAB. Wilkinson, Givens, we have Givens transformations. Forsyth, we have Householder Transformations. Um, and Rizzi and I wrote a paper about, the, and I'll tell you about in a minute, and Fritz Bauer uh, from Germany was the principal author of the Algol report about international algor algebraic language, which formed an important part of MATLAB. I wrote a thesis under Forsyth's direction about finite difference methods for eigenvalues of Laplacian I, this was the example I used in my thesis, this L-shaped domain. That became the MathWorks logo. And here's how MathWorks logo has evolved over the years as we've added, added three dimensions and color and a lighting model. 
we're the only company in the world that has a solution to a partial differential equation as our logo. <laughs> Forsyth and I wrote this book about computer solution of linear algebraic systems um, based on a course that we both taught. This has code in it for in Algol and Fortran and PL1 for actually solving linear systems. It was one of the first textbooks to actually have code in it. Here's Wilkinson. Wilkinson used to come to the United States every summer for a short course at the University of Michigan. Then he would go to Argonne Laboratory outside Chicago uh, to visit, to work on, uh, on this. Wilkinson was doing research on matrix eigenvalue problems. He published, the, published his research as programs, as Algol code for, doing, for computing eigenvalues. And these was eventually collected in this book. Uh, you can still read this book today if you want to see how we how these eigenvalue routines work or see the code for them. Go read the Algol in this book. It's very readable. But no one could run it because it was Algol and nobody had an Algol compiler. So Wilkinson was visiting Argon to help Argon produce this ice pack for eigen system package which was a project to convert all of Wilkinson's Algol to Fortran so people could actually use it. Um, the six authors there are from Argonne, and then I, I visited there in summer. That was followed by the LINPAC project, which was a project to produce Fortran subroutine library for solving linear systems. This is easier mathematically than the eigenvalue problem, but between LINPAC and ICEPAC, you now had a complete uh, suite of codes for solving uh, dense linear algebra. Here are the authors of LINPAC in 1979, Jack Dungara, uh, who's now a friend of you guys. How many of you know Jack? He's been here. Um, was a kid back then. Uh, there's me with sandals. Uh, Jack's LINPAC license plate. Pete Stewart and Jim Bunch. Here we are 33 years later. Um, Jack's lost the most hair, but, but I have the neatest shirt. Um, we took the codes from LINPAC. So LINPAC is now known as a benchmark rather than a, sweet, a subroutine library. And here's why. We took the codes from LINPAC and sent them around to universities and national laboratories around the country and asked them to run them, all the codes, just to see that they worked on their machines um, and, um, and to time one of them. This was a program that solved a, solved a 100 by 100 linear system and you timed it. Dungara penciled in those numbers which are the megaflops millions of floating point operations per second. The fastest machine in the world was the uh, new Cray at NCAR uh, in, in Colorado. It was doing 14 megaflops. Uh, the bottom of the list is the machine at Yale. Uh, it didn't have enough memory to solve a 100 by 100 linear system. So we had to do a 75 by 75 system and, ex and extrapolate. I can't time a 100 by 100 linear system on my laptop today. It happens too fast. Um, but that, that, that became the LINPAC benchmark, and it's the basis for the top 500 today. This is still running the LINPAC benchmark, still solving a system of simultaneous linear equations. It's much bigger, and it takes longer, but that's still just, that's deciding the fastest machine in the world. It's really boring because the Chinese build machines maybe to just run the LINPAC benchmark, we're not quite sure. Uh, but they're the fastest machines in the world. Uh, here's, here's, the, here's the one that, uh, I don't know where that is. Um, now let me tell you about this. Uh, I got time to tell this whole story if I, if I can. Uh, yeah, come here and help me get, do this mouse so I don't not fiddling with that. Um, in um, 
I want I want to get out of PowerPoint. Uh, or suspend that, yeah. and and be pre this prepared to click on this this movie here. Yeah. Okay. So let me tell you about it first. 1976, I made a film at Los Alamos. I was in New Mexico consulting in Los Alamos. I made a film about computing the singular value decomposition. The SVG was a new thing back then. We had just learned how to compute it from, from Golub. And, um, and I wanted to make a film about computing the singular value decomposition. I also wanted to exercise Los Alamos graphics. And that's what I want to show you here. Uh, these were using innovative stuff at, graph, at Los Alamos at the time. Uh, so click on that. I don't want to hear the whole introduction. Well, to a mathematician, I think. A third of the way through. There, back up. Okay, that, yeah, that's okay. Matrix analysis can describe the frequency and magnitude of such oscillations. This bridge near Tacoma, Washington, was uh, designed now and that, built nobody before ever the effects seen this of piece of film could there. be completely analyzed. You probably a lot of the you've seen it now. This is old hat. The wind has oscillations was, with unfortunate uh, results. Innovative stuff. Um, Modern computers are particularly well suited to solving problems involving large matrices. The designer of a system can obtain accurate predictions about the reaction of his system to external forces. Uh, now, the computer even is used this was hard the back matrix. then. So the You're about, of the entries yeah, some Greek letters, putting Greek letters on the screen known as the was, was new stuff then. The original right. matrix you didn't is have represented max, as a product didn't of three matrices. And putting, putting, doing mathematics matrices, on the screen The only non-zero elements lie on the diagonal. Uh, these elements, the singular values of the matrix, determine the frequencies of oscillation of the original system. That's not true. They the don't other determine two matrices must preserve the properties I, I got of the it wrong matrix. in the script. So they are Pete, orthogonal Pete matrices. Pete Stewart makes me Each give that disclaimer every time I show this film. Which affect only two rows or um, columns. Scientists at Los Alamos Scientific okay, Laboratory Okay, so here using the new the Los Alamos graphics library. Calculation of the singular Computing these intersections of these pyramids to computer users was hard. The that was a hidden out. line algorithm. In this, three this was before Z-buffer. And the, the way we do it today. So I'm, I'm going to try and show you how the, the singular value decomposition is computed. runs from the upper left to the lower right. Orthogonal transformations will be used to introduce zeros into the matrix. So it used to be the in Fortran. You would read from unit row, five, and then the first write column. to unit six. Each transformation but if you Los Alamos, if you wrote the unit seven, shown here in blue, they shipped it down later to the basement and made film out of it. Into later so they were columns, they were doing this was the zeros already obtained. sixteen millimeter celluloid film. It is that I get back in my box, output box, the next morning. So this first stage so I made produces this film a matrix doing that with non-zero elements directly anyway, below the diagonal, um, as well as elements. But the if, if you really want to know how the SVD scale, is computed, you can go to YouTube today and uh, type in Molar SVD and so watch the whole film. That each it's of kind the of fun to watch it. Values is obtained with a single iteration. Maybe, maybe I can. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, now the final now the, diagonal matrix okay, together yeah, with the two transforming matrix. Um, so in 19 before in a couple years later, the producers of the first Star Trek movie came to Los Alamos to get graphics to run on there. Now I'm going to keep the lights down because I'm going to show another piece of film. Uh, they wanted to get graphics to run in the in the background on the bridge on the Enterprise, um, and so they got uh, graphics from Los Alamos. And I'm going to take this film. This is a clip out of the first. Yeah, get it as dark as you can now. Um, I think I can get this. This is out of the first first ever Star Trek movie.
look over Spock's shoulder. <laughs> so, throughout the movie, the, st the singular value decomposition is being, <laughs> is being computed on Spock's, <laughs> Spock's screen. Just enough for us to break free. Break free to work, Commander. <laughs> we don't know that, Mr. Spock. Why are you opposed to trying? <laughs> and there's real graphics there. We're just about finished with it. Yeah. Okay. One last little bit. V'ger is threatening the universe, and they're going in to find V'ger. Uh, if any of you have ever seen this, remember this film. Why bring us inside? Not to destroy us. They could have done that outside. They still can. Curiosity, Mr. Decker. Insatiable curiosity. <laughs> There's a tagline for Ski Institute there. <laughs> curiosity, insatiable curiosity. Okay, so um, that was the uh, first Star Trek movie. And this is what it was doing. Here's it showing uh, that thing again, diagonalizing the matrix. Um, I was teaching numerical analysis and linear algebra, th thanks, at the University of New Mexico. I wanted to have my students use LINPACK and ICEPACK without writing Fortran programs. So I read this book by Klaus Wirth, he invented Pascal, and he had a simplified version of Pascal here called PL0. And this was how to parse uh, programming languages to generate code for PL0. So I wrote MATLAB in Fortran um, it, at this time, and uh, with PL0, with matrix is the only data type. It's a strongly typed language. It had only one type. And uh, that was the first version of MATLAB. Uh, here's a screenshot of the first version. Um, this was back in 1981. Uh, if you said help, there was a list of these functions. This is all the functions. There weren't M files. There weren't toolboxes. There's no ordinary differential equations. There's no FFT. Um, if you wanted to add functions, you'd get the Fortran source code from me, write new subroutines in Fortran, and add them to the parse table to uh, expand this list. Here's what some of the things you could do. This was a joke about what graphics was like. This was portable machine independent graphics in the 1970s. 1979, I visited Stanford on a sabbatical. Uh, I taught a numerical analysis course, graduate course in numerical analysis. Half the students were math and computer science. They weren't impressed. I used this, I used this MATLAB, uh, among other things. And uh, th this was not a sophisticated programming language. It wasn't a programming language, it was just a calculator. Uh, it wasn't sophisticated numerical analysis research. But the other half of the students were from engineering, and they loved MATLAB. They were doing things that I didn't know anything about, control theory and signal processing, and matrices was the language for, the, for these uh, system theory that they studied, and they, uh, they wrote programs in MATLAB. Uh, they went off to a couple of companies that had spun off the Stanford EE department 
that were near in Palo Alto that were doing control theory on, on contracts to the Air Force. One was ISI. They built something called Matrix X on top of my origin, on top of my MATLAB, uh, with my permission, and um, that became a product of theirs. Matrix X had ended up being a competitor for MATLAB for years to come. Uh, Crosstown at System Control Technology, they built a package called Control C, one of the great all-time names for a piece of software, and. Um, um, a guy named Jack Little was the principal uh, developer of, of Control C. He hadn't taken my course, but a friend of his had, and he showed Jack um, MATLAB. And Jack threw away all his Fortran and started using MATLAB. Um, he came to me a couple years later and said he wanted to start a software company. Um, so I, I said, "Great, go ahead. Good, good luck." And um, he disappeared into the hills behind Stanford, threw away, uh, quit his job at SCT, spent a year, a year and a half reprogramming MATLAB and C, which was a gutsy thing to do back then because C had never been used for a large scale technical uh, program like this. He had a friend named Steve Bangert, helped him work on that. And the three of us, oh, Jack, Jack used this machine. The, P the PC had just come out. Jack went down to Sears and with his own money bought a compact portable and used this machine. At first he didn't even have a hard drive. He had to uh, put floppies in and out. And um, the three of us founded MathWorks in California in 1984. We, there was no, uh, the, you know, the software had not been written with the idea of starting a company. Uh, and uh, these, these people, the people in control theory found it useful and Jack started the company. He was the only employee the first year. We had two to the zero people. Uh, the next year Bangert went to work for the company. We had two to the one people and the company never developed it. It doubled every year for the next seven years. There's a log plot of the size of MathWorks <laughs> over the last uh, 30 plus years. We haven't continued to double every year, which is a good thing. Otherwise, we'd have two to the 34th people. Uh, <laughs> and, and worse yet, we'd have to hire another two to the 34th in the next year. Here we were when we had uh, two to the three people. There's eight people in, in uh, South Natick. Jack's down in the front row. Uh, Lauren Shore up there on the uh, uh, on her, her on the right on the left side of the picture still works for us, uh, and so does Jim Tung. I didn't work for the company for the first five years. I went off to try and find my fortune in Silicon Valley, uh, but that's a whole other story. In in 1989, I gave up Silicon Valley, or they gave me up. I joined Cup MathWorks full time. Uh, here's two to the fifth people, uh, and and uh, I'm over here on the left. And here's Jack. Boy, that sure is tremory. And there's Jack on the upper right. Uh, here was a couple of pictures in San Diego a couple of years ago when we had our 30th anniversary and had 3,000 people then. So. MathWorks today is, um, uh, has about 4,000 people. It uh, has offices at more than 20 places around the world. Uh, most, most of these are sales and support offices. Uh, but there is some, some development done in Cambridge, England, in Edinburgh, Scotland, and uh, Pater Paderborn, Germany, and in India. Uh, but most of it is done here. This is our campus uh, off of Route 9 in, in uh, Natick, Massachusetts, about 15 miles west of downtown Boston, near the Massachusetts Turnpike. Now, this is an important slide, uh, but I, I don't, I, I, I'm not going to talk about it very much. 
Um, MATLAB is way beyond matrix laboratory today. Uh, on the list of most popular programming languages of the IT, uh, the IEEE publishes, were number seventh or eighth uh, after C and Java uh, and Python and R. Um, but be, but we're we're gone beyond matrix laboratory, and we're used in a wide range of industries. There's a, uh, a, a what is that in the upper left? What is that up in the upper right, Orly? Uh, DNA molecule. We're into bio bio stuff. Um, here's a uh, yeah. Well, I can't point to those things. There's a hearing aid. My wife was looking for a hearing aid for her mother. She says, hey, Cleve, here's a MATLAB plot. Sure enough, they had a MATLAB plot on their home page. There's about a dozen hearing aid companies in the world, and all of them use MATLAB for development. Uh, in the center at the bottom is image processing, a, a car driving at dusk in a stormy night, uh, trying to, in motion, trying to read the license plate number. Um, chips and, and circuits on the, in the right, lab equipment. On the top is, represents our principal business, which is control theory. So uh, programming that vehicle is a delicate control theory problem. You simulate the, simulate uh, the quadcopter on a computer screen of people doing it, um, and then generate the code that controls it and download it into the uh, into the device. In the center is the Chevrolet Volt. There's about there's something like four dozen microprocessors in the Volt, and they're all programmed using MATLAB. Again, the engineers doing that. Sit at consoles like computer consoles, like all the rest of us, run simulations of the part they're uh, developing, and then download the code that drives that car into the in, into in the microprocessor with goals in the vault. So MATLAB doesn't run in your car, but code generated by MATLAB does. Um, the same is true of the of the satellite that flew past Pluto a couple months ago. I'm not sure about Cassini. I got to find out what was happening in Cassini, but I do know that the one that went by Pluto was was code generated by MATLAB. They sit at consoles. This is in at in uh, uh, Hopkins or someplace that that's by Maryland. Simulate what they want to do with the with the satellite. Generate control code and then send that control code to the satellite. It takes eight minutes to get there. You talk about latency. Um, and the damn well better be right, right? Because they don't get to test it. Anyway, um, so that's, that's, that's how we make a living, is doing, doing all these kinds of things. Um, I've got, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll um, Let's see. I'll show this. This is fun. This is work that the by Nicholas Troji at, at um, who was in Germany is now in Canada. You can go to the web page called Biomotion Lab and see this work. He's interested in the human gait, particularly how we as humans recognize what other people are like by watching them walk. Um, how what, can you see somebody walk? Is he sad, happy? Is he male? Is she, is she female? How do we know that from the walk? So he puts his graduate students on the treadmill with, with uh, markers on them and follows these markers as they walk. Um, that produces, um, you get captures about um, t t t uh, dozen seconds of the walk, a um, couple dozen steps, 
that's a couple thousand frames. There are three, there are 15 markers on the body, or he follows 15 markers, and they, rep, they are move in three dimensions. So you get these time series, uh, 45 of them, that show what the, uh, the, the uh, subject is walking. The raw data is a matrix with 45 rows and a couple thousand columns. Here's what the signal looked like. You can see this periodic motion of these various, of these various steps as they're walking along. Uh, and he wants to uh, do model reduction and, and get out the essence of that walk. Here's when you zoom in on what the signal looks like. His model is five terms of a Fourier series uh, with the only nonlinear parameter is omega, the frequency. He, computes, he finds that by a Fourier analysis. And then he computes five vectors. These are the principal components of that walk. He's using its SVD. Orly was showing me some work earlier today about how she's using the SVD to do uh, far more sophisticated stuff and li more life important stuff than this um, in, in cancer research. But that takes and reduces the thousands of columns of the matrix down to five. These five vectors that represent the uh, five coefficients in this uh, Fourier series. He then takes all the walkers, so he gets this, he gets five components for each walker. Then they're half female and half male. The, the, the five components don't come out to be gender. You can't tell the gender from the first five components. But he takes half the subjects are female, half are male, and he computes uh, singular values of the males and singular values of the females. That's two different matrices, M and, M and F. And then he adds those two together, takes the average of those. That's a universal walker, common man, an eigenwalker. And the difference between those two is the gender. So let me show you. Uh, that's all the slides I've got. So let me show you that app. Um, I hadn't brought that up front. Uh, um, oh, this is not the right one. Okay, I found it. So here's six of the subjects. Right? This is not actually the not actual data. It's their it's their five vectors in the Fourier series. But it, this gets about 95, 97 percent of their walking. So you can see different personalities here as we go through these go through these guys. Uh, so, uh, now poor Jamie here is having a bad day. <laughs> <laughs> but we don't, how do we know that? What is it about Jamie's gait that uh, tells you he's having a bad day? How do you recognize that right away? Let me get to my two favorites here. Pablo and Patricia here in the. Uh, <laughs> all right, so those are extremes of these two. All right, so um, so when you combine all that, uh, you get the Eigenwalker. 
And here, here is here is the typical walker. Um, there, there are these components, the principal components here. If I just take, let me remember how I did this. Oh, I wanted there's there's supposed to be. Uh, oh, well. um, if I reduce the magnitude of these things, you get, this is just something called stride, we call stride. Add to that some sway, uh, and then uh, some motion that's in phase with the, the upper, lower, upper body and lower body are in phase, and then here they are out of phase, and we get um, somebody that walks. Somebody that looks pretty good walking. Uh, but as I said, gender isn't in these five components. Um, so here's uh, a gender button. Uh, now... Can you tell which gender that is? Pixar and Disney long ago knew that you had to overemphasize these things in animations. So let's move that coefficient up by a factor of three. Now you can recognize the gender. <laughs> I didn't tell you which it is, but we all see what it is. How do we know that? And then let's go over here to the male. <laughs> It's in the elbows that we, that we see gender. <laughs> okay. Um, so that's, that's just a fun thing that I love to show. And it, it's singular value decomposition. It's numerical linear algebra is underlying that, uh, underlying that demo. It's the same tool that Spock was using to uh, <laughs> uh, find V'ger. <laughs> Okay, um, so even with the even with the uh, um, the version for the for the burrows, I've got if I I got um, I want to make I'll, I'll talk talk something about I, about HPC. Um, if it's if it's uh, I think it's back down here on. Um, so let me just go right to this. Um, so, um, so we have a parallel computing toolbox. Uh, it runs on big computers. I don't think you have it on your big computer here. Um, most people, I mean, it, 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 it's, we're not in the high performance computing business. We're in supercomputing for everybody else. We're not trying to do the top 500. Uh, and here's, and most of the parallel computing toolbox is used in this way. Um, the, let me, let me go. Oh, okay. I, I was with this Intel-based startup in Oregon that built the first parallel computer that was one of the Hypercube. Uh, we had a conference on Hypercubes in Tennessee. Here's from the, out of the proceedings. And I'm the guy who invented embarrassingly parallel. Uh, embarrassingly parallel means that you're, it's just, a bunch of independent processes running 
uh, was a parameter sweep or Monte Carlo, something like that. Um, the, the machine ran on 220 volts. There, um, we didn't have 220 volts in the, in the parlor at the hotel where we had the machine. So we went out and rented a gas generator and ran a cable, across, a cord across the swimming pool to get into the parlor uh, to run the machine. When I gave a talk about the machine, uh, somebody asked me how many megaflops per gallon are you getting? <laughs> well, that's important today, right? That's what we're all, that's the big qu question facing high performance computing is how much energy are you using? More, is, is as important as uh, how many megaflops you're getting. But um, most of the parallel, so the parallel computing toolbox has a parallel for loop, par, fo uh, par four, par pool initiates the use of multiple, multiple copies of MATLAB, par four runs a bunch of independent loops, and then there are other things like SPMD and uh, where you can uh, do more sophisticated parallel computing. Uh, but most of the work is being done like this. Uh, when you came in, I was playing blackjack. Maybe you saw some of that. There's an old blackjack program that I wrote years ago that simulates the game of blackjack and, and the best strategy for blackjack, not card counting, but just playing blackjack and seeing what the dealer's card is. The statistics of the blackjack, this is a financial instrument. This is like simulating the stock market or uh, options prices, uh, some of the same statistics. So this is a stand in for those. So this program plays four players, um, uh, playing 10,000 hands of blackjack. And uh, the par four says these four calls blackjack, which is this program I wrote years ago that plays blackjack, and it calls them four times with independent starting random number seeds. That's a whole important story. But then collects uh, the results together. Now, I want you to look at the array B. Where does B live? This, this program runs on a front end, a master, uh, and it sets up B, but each of the four uh, workers has to put something into B, and then uh, finally we plot it, and we get this, we get this plot. So uh, blue was making, did pretty well. The two colors there in the middle uh, did Midland, and then the purple lost money. Uh, but in this run, we came out a little bit ahead over these 40,000 hands of blackjack. That's a typical uh, kind of simulation that's done with parallel MATLAB. If I run that on my laptop, my laptop has two cores. Uh, if I run it just without saying par pool, it takes eight seconds. And when I start up two more MATLABs, uh, each of them simulates two players, the thing takes four seconds. So, so there's linear speed up uh, on, uh, on this uh, embarrassingly parallel, almost, it's, it's not quite embarrassingly parallel because that array B collects the results together. And uh, there's some, um, if this is on a distributed memory uh, cluster, there's some MPI going on underneath to get the results back and forth between the, the master and the workers. Okay, that's it on um, parallel computing. Let me summarize here. Um, MATLAB, uh, so, MATLAB's historical and, and intellectual basis is a numerical linear algebra, but we'll go way beyond that today. 
and its commercial success is based in te technical computing. Nevertheless, it's still based on mathematics. So this quote from Jim McClellan at Georgia Tech says, MATLAB wasn't designed to do X, uh, but it uh, can, can do, do it because it's based on, based on mathematics. And some principles of basic, some ideas from computing like array pro, array processing arrays and using that notation to use to do arrays. Okay, that's it for... <laughs>
selling MATLAB to universities now where all the faculty and all the students can use it without having to access a, a license server. So we do things like that to make it uh, easier to, easier to uh, install if on an individual machine and easier to get um, access to the necessary licenses. Yeah, APL stands for A programming language. It was it was um, a, a book that I, Ken Iverson from IBM Research he used it in a book. His intention was to be able to describe algorithms in this in this language, and he didn't think of it just like Matt. He didn't think of it as a, as a necessarily implementing it uh, as programming. Um, is a programming tool. And then other people at IBM Research uh, it implemented it, and it was available on IBM machines years ago. It's an array language, but it's, it, it, it's, obs I, kn I knew about it, but the, the syntax is, is, uh, is awful. It's really cryptic. It's, it's elegant. But really cryptic. Got one of my graduate students walked in my office one day and showed me this line of gibberish and says, Hey, Cleve, look at this. And I says, What's that? He says, It's your algorithm. I says, Why algorithm for what? It, it was an APL program that I couldn't read. I had no idea what it was doing. The character set was idiosyncratic. So, an array programming language was a good idea. Um, I, I used to say that MATLAB was, was APL, portable APL with a civilized syntax. Um, there was another thing called Speakeasy developed at Argonne uh, by a guy named Stan Cohen. That was another array programming language that um, uh, I, that I was aware of and that I had used a bit. So these things were, these were things were in the air back then, and certainly influenced my thinking. All right, let's thank Cleve for a really interesting talk. Thank you for.